it was an acute demoral withdrawal. And when that happens, not only are you revved up, you're also desperate. And I think that that is where he could not be turned off. And therefore, there was no possibility for him to sleep. I gave him 25 milligrams of propofol, which is so minuscule. I would not expect anyone to have any kind of sedation from that. So when Michael drifted into sleep, I was of the opinion, finally, fatigue had caught up with him. I was of the opinion that by him seeing the white, the white milky substance in the syringe uh, was the placebo effect I'm looking for, um, just to see if he would be able to relax and, and go to sleep. But he did sleep. Interestingly, when Michael Jackson was treated with propofol infusions in the past, like a continuous drip overnight, he would be a snorer. In this case, he was not. So I sat down, knowing the hot propofol work, I sat there and monitored Jackson for a minimum of 35 minutes before I left. And that was three times that was required for any kind of side effect or complication from any dose of propofol because propofol is its own antidote. When I left his bedside to conduct business, I was comfortable. I thought I did everything reasonable. There was no, no way he could get into trouble. You know, um, I would wake him up and I would say goodbye, I'm going home. But at least he would have gotten a little bit of rest because he had to go to rehearsals anytime shortly after noon that day. So I went away, conducted my business, spoke to people on the phone, and then I was coming back after a while towards Michael's room. Things were not the same. It was shockingly different. Michael was not on, on the pillow as I left him. He had moved. I picked up the pace and got to him and realized he was not breathing, checked for pulses. In, the, in his radial pulses, his brachial pulses, check his carotid, there's just no pulses, there's just no breath sounds. He was completely lifeless. As a cardiologist, I immediately initiated resuscitative measures. I don't know what happened. That's the one thing, in, and I don't want to gesticulate in my absence. All I can say is that when I came back, Mr. Jackson was not in the same position there was no signs of life. I did CPR on Michael. <clears throat> I started with an ambu bag to ventilate him, but that, of course, is not effective. And I did something that I've never done before. In the, in the effort to help him, I did mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. I always wondered if I could ever had the heart to do something like that. It, I did not hesitate to, to, um, to do that. Um, once... Security, once I made the call to Michael Amir, who was head of security, he was not at home at the house. He did not pick up the call. It made matters worse. I left a message saying I needed, I had an emergency, I needed security to call me. Michael Amir called back after some time had passed. During that period of time, I, I was the single operator trying to resuscitate Mr. Jackson. After that call, still nobody showed up. I kept looking at the door, and I'm, I'm still doing CPR by myself. No one came to the door, no knocks, nothing. I, can, I don't understand why there was a delay. So from that, I had to stop, run out of the room, down the back stairs, get to the landing, and call out to the chef, get security, get Prince, get help. Prince was mentioned because he was the bigger of all, biggest of the children. Security is not allowed in the house. It's a 14,000 square foot, three level storage home. How would they have known where to go? Bounce from room to room until they figure it out? They needed some help. The kids knew exactly where I was because when security arrived or later, the kids were right at their feet. And at that time, when I saw the children, I had security immediately escort them out while I continued to do CPR. But I did give an order right then to call 911 which he could have done. He took a while after um, taking the children out and came back to the room and I said, did you call 911? No, he, was, he hadn't done it. He was going to do it then. So that's when the 911 called with me. He had an IV line 
going into his leg. You know, he had trouble with his veins. He had very fibrotic veins. It was difficult to find places to put IVs on Michael. So knowing that, I did not want that IV to be lost. And I knew if I tried to lift Michael up by myself, that IV would be gone and it could be near impossible to find one. Well, when paramedics came into the room and offered to assist him to move from the bed, I told them and I warned them. Nonetheless, three paramedics moving one person could not keep the line in place and the line became non-functional. There is a rule of, in medicine that I follow for cardiac arrest patients. If a patient is down for every minute that they're not attended to, there's a 10% chance of mortality. So you take it very simply. What if Michael Jackson was down for 20 minutes before I discovered him? His chance for death was 200%. I asked them to allow me to put in a central line, which I could easily have placed on his femoral vein, left or right. I could have placed an internal jugular vein for them. Whatever they wanted, I can do it because I place hundreds of that per year. I'm an interventional cardiologist. But they were taking orders from UCLA emergency room physician. And they kept poking and going everywhere and couldn't find a vein. Finally, by the luck of the draw, somebody got a vein in his neck where I could have placed it in seconds. And then when they placed that tube in his line, the cat in his neck, it was 25 minutes later after they arrived. But there's a protocol in Los Angeles. If after 20 minutes on the scene of an acute decompensation of patient requiring heroics, you call the case, you, you pronounce the patient. Now that was a problem for me. Are you, are you crazy? You did nothing. And you want to pronounce him because of a protocol? Time? Hell no. I asked him to call UCLA, and I spoke to the doctor, and I said, I am going to assume care for Mr. Jackson. Would you transfer? She agreed. I said, prepare for him. He's coming. And I took him to UCLA. When he got to UCLA, Michael Jackson was performed, worked with for over an hour at UCLA. And they did not do that just because they wanted to just perform CPR and heroics on Michael Jackson. They performed resuscitative measures on Michael because he had signs of life. An echocardiogram was done in Michael. And when they look at the images, his heart was contracting, but weakly, not strong enough to generate a pulse, but the heart was contracting. That was very hopeful. So they continued to do CPR and heroics, and 20 minutes after they repeated the test, his heart was still doing the same thing. But as it continued for a while, and it was over an hour, and they had done by then everything that they could, they pronounced it.